So I made one simple rule. I said, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. I'll have it on Saturday and Sunday if I really want it, but I'll never have it on a weekday. I just want to prove I'm in control. And that way, when I was at Starbucks and I heard a little voice in my head staring at the chocolate bar saying, oh, go ahead. You've worked out hard enough today. You're not going to gain any weight. You can have a little chocolate. Besides, it's just as easy. You can start again tomorrow. I would go, whoa, that's my inner pig. Chocolate is pig slop on a Wednesday. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. Hey there, and welcome back to another episode of the Reshape Your Health podcast. I'm really excited about today's episode because it's a relevant topic that we haven't covered before, all about binge eating, overeating, and food addiction. So today I'm speaking with Dr. Glenn Livingston. He's a PhD and a psychologist. He was the longtime CEO of a multi-million dollar consulting firm, which serviced several Fortune 500 clients in the food industry. And this experience gives him firsthand knowledge of how the food industry is manufacturing foods in a way to keep us coming back for more. So it's a really an uphill battle to climb to overcome food addiction. And in his book, Never Binge Again, he teaches us unique solutions to overcome overeating and food addiction based both on his personal experience, which I think is so important, but also his research with over 40,000 people. Dr. Livingston, welcome to the program. We are so excited to have you here today. I have been looking forward to this all week. Thank you for having me. Yes. Is it okay if I call you Glenn? Please do. Perfect. Well, give us a little bit of your story. I kind of mentioned in the intro, you worked in the food industry and how did that kind of develop your perspective around food addiction and overeating? Well, I mean, it's important that people know that I'm not just a doctor that works with overeaters, but I actually had a very serious food problem myself. And I, I was a child and family psychologist by training, actually. And I would, I would turn away eating disordered people for the most part, um, because I felt like it wasn't ethical when I was struggling with it. Um, I, so the question is, how did the food industry work influence my own perspective? Well, for about two decades that I struggled with overeating myself, I mostly thought that I must have a hole in my heart, because like, I'm a psychologist from a family of 17 psychotherapists. And when something breaks in the house, everybody asks it how it feels and nobody knows how to fix it. So I, I thought that everything had a psychological cause. And I thought if I could heal the hole in my heart, then I wouldn't have to heal the hole in my stomach. So I spent a lot of years going for therapy and going to Overeaters Anonymous and um, going on a very spiritual, soulful journey, which I don't regret because it made me a very um, reflective and deep person, I think. But it didn't really help me with the binge eating. It didn't really help me with that. Um, when I was, my ex-wife traveled for business, so we didn't have kids and I didn't commute and I had a lot of time in my hands. So I developed a dual career. So in addition to my clinical practice, I was doing advertising consulting for the food industry and the pharmaceutical industry. And it was like I was on the wrong side of the war, but I didn't know it back then. Um, and I saw at one point how they were engineering these hyper palatable food-like substances, concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and excitotoxins and salt. And, and it's all geared to hit the lizard brain, the bliss point in the lizard brain, without giving us enough nutrition to feel satisfied. And that was one of several things that helped me to flip my paradigm to say, wait a minute, maybe this is not a love yourself thin paradigm. Maybe nurture my inner wounded child is doing me a world of good psychologically because I feel better about myself, but maybe it's doing nothing for my overeating. And um, when I combine that with an understanding, when I started to study neurology a little bit and I read some alternative addiction treatment models that pointed out that the part of the brain that the industry is targeting is the reptilian brain, I call it the lizard brain, the, the brainstem. It, it's this part of the brain that looks at something in the environment and says, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? 
do I kill it? So I'm just going to use that mm. as an example of the, yeah. the reptilian brain. It's like a bad college drinking game, eat, mate, or kill. Um, <sighs> then, and there's no love there. That's the point is there's no love there. The mammalian brain says, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, are you considering what it's going to do to your family and those that you love? And then the neocortex says, a neurologist would take me to task on some of this, but it's basically what how the brain works. The neocortex says, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact is that going to have on your long-term goals, like health and fitness and weight loss, but also the kind of person you're trying to be in society and your spirituality and your music and your art and everything that's really uniquely human. And what helped me to switch paradigms when I understood this was that I'd been spending 20 years trying to love myself out of an addiction when the part of the brain that responds to addiction doesn't know love. And the outside force of the food industry uh, was so crystal clear and apparent to me that had nothing to do with whether my mom, mama loved me enough or you know, that I feel guilty about something from when I was really little. Um, and, and then I looked at the advertising industry. And I remember this one story in particular where, I mean, what, what they do is they spend billions to make all that hyperpalatable stuff look appealing. Um, and I remember I had a friend who was the vice president of marketing for a big food bar manufacturer. And as he was leaving the business, he said to me, Glenn, I got to tell you something. The most profitable thing we ever did in that business was to take the vitamins out of the bar. I said, you took the vitamins out of the bar? He said, yeah, they were expensive and they made the bar taste bad. So we took the vitamins out of the bar and we put the money into the packaging instead. And we invested in this multicolored, vibrant packaging. And it turns out in nature, on an evolutionary basis, we're attuned to respond to multicolored vibrancy as a signal of the availability of micronutrients. Mm -hmm. So you've heard the expression, eat the rainbow. When you see something that has, you know, a bright yellow and, and bright red and dark dark blue and dark green, you're thinking you've come across uh, one of the world's greatest salads, you know, but you haven't. Those micronutrients aren't there. They're faking us out. And I don't mean to single out the food bar manufacturer because this goes on across the industry in all sorts yeah. of different ways. And so I said, wow. So there are all these billions of dollars engineered to hit the bliss points in my brain. And it has nothing to do with love. These are outside forces. Um, then I did this study and I, I did it for myself. I was getting paid a lot of money to do these studies. So I did a 40,000 person study for myself when internet clicks were cheap in 1999, took a couple of years and I intercepted people when they were feeling stressed and searching for solutions to stress. And I asked them what they were stressed about. And I asked them what specific foods they turned to when they were stressed that they couldn't stop eating. And I found three interesting correlations people who turned to chocolate, which is how all of my binges tended to start. Um, if you ever were at the Woodbury Country Deli in the 90s and they were out of chocolate, it's probably because I was there first. Um, they tended to be lonely or brokenhearted or a little depressed. People who turned to uh, salty, crunchy things like chips and pretzels, they tend to be stressed at work. And people who turned to chewy things like bread and pasta and pizza, they tended to be stressed at home. And I thought that was really interesting. So I called my mom up because uh, my mom is a psychotherapist and also a chocoholic. And I said, mom, I think I've got something, but I want to know how did this all start? Because you're in the unique position of being a therapist and my mother, you're the one who fed me. I said, and she got really impressed. I said, mom, it's okay. I forgive you. Whatever happened, it was 40 years ago. I, I love you. This was 15 years ago now. Um, I just want to figure it out. So she gets all sheepish and ashamed. And she says, I'm so sorry, honey, but when you were one year old in 1965, your father was a captain in the army and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam. And I was terrified. Not only did I have you know, one small kid that was you, but we were trying to get pregnant with your sister. And I thought I'm going to be an army widow with two small kids and I want to have to take care of them. It's going to be awful. At the same time, my father, your grandfather had just gotten out of prison and I didn't know that he was guilty. And I'd always idolized him. He was my salvation. He was the only real love connection I had in my family. And he was in prison. I didn't even know where he was. And so half the time I was depressed and staring at the wall and anxious about your dad and depressed about your grandfather. 
And when you would come running to me looking for um, love or for a hug or to play or to have some healthy food, I didn't have the wherewithal to give it to you. So half the time I kept a bottle of chocolate Bosco syrup and a refrigerator on the floor. And I'd say, honey, go get your Bosco. And you'd go crawling over to the refrigerator and you'd open it up and you'd open the cap and you'd suck on the bottle and you'd go into a chocolate sugar coma. And if this were the movies, at this point, mom and I would have a big hug and a big cry and I would never have chocolate again, right? Um, and it was a good, we had a metaphorical hug and we kind of you know, forgave each other. And I learned a lot more about her. I could ask her some questions about that time in her life. And I had a lot of empathy for what she went through. As a result, I had a lot more empathy for myself. So that voice of self-castigation when I would have my binges was softer. But I actually wound up eating more chocolate. Hmm. And the reason I wound up eating more chocolate was there was this voice in my head. And it was a voice of justification. And it said something like this. You know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough. And she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. And until we can, you know, get out of this bad marriage and find the love of our lives, we have to keep on eating chocolate. Let's go get somewhere right now. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Let's do it. At that point, I said to myself, maybe I have the idea wrong. Maybe the idea isn't to put out the fire, like if the emotional upset is the fire. Maybe the idea is to build a better fireplace. And maybe this voice of justification is poking holes in the fireplace. So I started to look at, rather than having to solve my emotional problems or dampen down the fire, started to look at what was greasing the shoot between those problems or those emotions and the actual damaging behavior, which would be akin to an ash getting out of the fireplace and burning down the house. Because a fire in the living room in a well-contained fireplace is an asset, not a liability, right? People gather around, becomes the center of hearth and home. They tell stories, they make memories, they cry and they laugh. It's an, it's an asset, not a liability. Okay. So then I did something a little nutty. Um, and I never thought I was going to be famous for this. I never thought I was going to be public with it. I was, a, I was a, you know, I was running a coach training organization. I was a child and family psychologist. Um, I was doing, I was not doing consulting for big business anymore at that point. And as I was, I was a little embarrassed about this part because I'm a sophisticated <laughs> psychologist, but here's what I did. I decided that there were other bodily organs um, which generated very powerful urges for expression, which I controlled. So what I was dealing with was the lizard brain, which is just a bodily organ. It's like this thing inside of you that generated food urges. And I said, well, you know, my bladder is one such organ. So for example, Dr. Morgan, if I really had to pee right now, I would tell my bladder that I'm sorry, but I don't have the time to do that right now. I'm in the middle of an important interview. Um, your needs come second to mine. I'll recognize your authentic need, but I'm in charge. And that's no problem. Um, I mean, maybe in 30 years, it'll be a problem, but it's not a problem now. The, the, um, there could be an attractive woman on the street and I'm, I'm not going to go run down and kiss her. Um, there is a time and a place and a way to approach people like that. But my bodily organs generate very powerful urges nonetheless. And I'm, as a civilized member of society, take responsibility for um, the way that I express those urges. And I'm, I'm actually kind of shy, so I don't normally express those urges at all. Um, and I said, well, why is this any different? I said, well, what do, what do I need in order to do it? And there was a guy who wrote a book on alternative addiction treatment who was working with the black and white addictions, um, you know, things you could give up entirely like drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. And he was the first one that really pointed out to me that the uh, reptilian brain was responsible for addiction. And so he, um, he had a technique for kind of separating the two. And so what I decided I was going to do something like that, and I would call my inner reptilian brain my inner pig. I, I'm sorry, but that's what I called it. I wish I called it a food monster, but I called it my inner pig. You don't have to call it a pig for this to work. That's just what I called it. I was not going to be public. Then I decided that I, I would have to figure out how to know when this thing was becoming active. 
And if I was going to recognize it, I was going to have to draw a very clear line between healthy and unhealthy eating. So I made one simple rule. I said, I will never have chocolate on a weekday again. I'll have it on Saturday and Sunday if I really want it, but I'll never have it on a weekday. I just want to prove I'm in control. And that way, when I was at Starbucks and I heard a little voice in my head staring at the chocolate bar saying, oh, go ahead. You worked out hard enough today. You're not going to gain any weight. You can have a little chocolate. Besides, it's just as easy. You can start again tomorrow. I would go, whoa, that's my inner pig. Chocolate is pig slop on a Wednesday. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. It's very primitive. It was very primitive. And I've since learned that part of overcoming overeating is learning to recognize that when that survival drive is active, like th there's a reason people say just hand over the chocolate and nobody gets hurt. It's because the chocolate brand manufacturers have gotten very good at fooling your survival drive into thinking that you need this to survive. So it's, it's not a rational undertaking. It's, a, it's an activation of this emergency response, fight, flight, freeze, feast or famine. And I, I've, I've, um, I've subsequently learned that if I can do something at that moment to get out of the reptilian brain, one of my favorite things to do is take what Lori Hammond calls a 7-11 breath. Breathe in for a count of seven, breathe out for a count of 11. Because if there is no emergen if there was an emergency, you would not have time to do that. If you had a hungry bear chasing after you, you couldn't take several 7-11 breaths um, you'd have to be running and getting as much air as you could. Then what I like to do is write down what the pig is saying, mm -hmm. because there's usually some element of truth in it. And then there is some false logic that greases the shoot to the exception. So the element of truth, for example, in that moment at Starbucks was that it's true if I had one chocolate bar after the hard workout that I did, that I probably wouldn't gain weight. That's probably true. There are two things that are not true. First of all, it's unlikely I would have just one chocolate bar. I would probably have 17 um, or six chocolate bars and a whole pizza was my thing back then. Secondly, the way the brain works, there's a principle called neuroplasticity, which says what fires together, wires together. Mm -hmm. What that means is if I have a craving for chocolate today and I reinforce that with the chocolate, I'm going to have a stronger craving for chocolate tomorrow. It also means that if I have the thought, gee, I might as well start tomorrow, it would be just as easy, um, and I reinforce that with chocolate, I'm more likely to have that thought again tomorrow. So it's not just as easy to start tomorrow. It's harder to start tomorrow. You always have to use the present moment to be healthy. If you're in a hole, stop digging. So I would, I would go through that process, and I would disempower, and I, I, would, I would, it's like pouring sand on the grease chute. And it made it much harder for the impulse to get into action. It wasn't a miracle. It would wake me up at the point of impulse, at the moment of impulse. Give me those extra microseconds to make the right decision if I wanted to. I didn't always make the right decision. What was a miracle was that I no longer felt confused or powerless. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was actually in control. I was the boss. Then after a while, I experimented with different kinds of rules, like what if I said I will, I will always start my day with a 16-ounce green smoothie, or I'll only eat pretzels at a Major League Baseball stadium, or I eventually I got to I'll never have chocolate again. I eventually decided I had to abstain entirely. I know you wanted to talk about that. Um, and I, I decided that if I was in charge, and I, I, I might as well make rules that I could follow. Mm -hmm. So I made simple rules that I could follow, even if I wouldn't lose weight. I decided the most important thing wasn't losing the weight. The most important thing was getting my control back because the desperation, the sense of hating myself, the, um, the sense that I wasn't really present for my life or my patients came from feeling like this thing was in control. It had broken my spirit and I needed to reclaim my spirit. And I figured once that was done, I would adjust the rules for health and fitness and weight loss. Um, and essentially, that's what happened. I slowly but surely adjusted the rules over the course of about a year. I kept a journal for eight years after I did that about all the things that my pig would say and how they were wrong. And then in 2015, as I was starting to get divorced, I'd wound up as a minor partner in a publishing company. Mm -hmm. And I'd had this talk with the, with the CEO 
who said, um, you know, we really need to publish our own book because we're not attracting high enough authors. And the reason is, is we can't do the intense marketing we want to do for these authors, um, you know, because some of it's experimental. None of it was shady or anything, but it was experimental. Is we need a book to experiment with on our own. Could you write a book? And I said, well, I've got this pig inside me, see, and <laughs> I've been keeping this journal, see? So I turn it into a book. I send it to him. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, he calls me back. He says, Glenn, I've got a pig inside me. Donuts are pig slop. I don't eat donuts. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. And he proceeded to lose almost 100 pounds over the next 18 months. And we published the book and um, took about a year. And then it started to take off. And now we've got over a million readers. And people sometimes come up to me at a bookstore and they don't quite know my name, but they just point at me and they go, pig guy, pig guy. So, um, so that all came from the question that you asked about how the food industry influenced my thinking. It influenced me to think more like an alpha wolf that mm-hmm. required, that really had to take charge and required a really good defense against what the food industry was doing rather than someone who had to fill the hole in his own heart and take a, psycho, a purely psychological approach to, um, to ending overeating. So that, yeah. that's how it influenced me. I've really enjoyed just sitting here, listening to your story. I think the big takeaway there is, you know, there's a pig inside of me and I don't listen to farm animals. <laughs> yes. and I like that you really gave truth to your feelings as well. I think that's important that you um, wrote down. I'm a big fan of journaling that you said, okay, there is truth here. You know, if I have this chocolate bar, it probably won't make me gain weight. What are the other truths? It's not just going to be one chocolate bar for me. Um, and then I think it's very important. I'm big on like micro goals. And I think there's very similar philosophy there. It's set your own goal. You know, it's you create your own goal for the week and you follow through and you build that sense of self-confidence that you are a capable, competent person to change your habits. I wanted to dig into the differences between overeating and food addiction. And Mm -hmm. what's your perspective and opinion there on maybe a listener doesn't know if they have just general overeating or binge eating or true food addiction. So how do you tease out those different characteristics? So so that's a very good question. Um, And there's also a problem with the question in and of itself. I'm sure there is. Yeah. So I'll I'll give you a straight answer, but then I'm going to tell you what the problem is with the question. Um, If you were to Google DSM-5 binge eating disorder, you get a list of criteria that very, um, very effectively isolates a diagnostic entity called binge eating disorder, where people eat to the point of discomfort and beyond their own best judgment uh, multiple times per week, and they're um, feel horrendous because of it. There, there's a level of um, depression and anxiety that goes on, on with it, but even more self-loathing. And there's a feeling of being out of control. Um, I might not be quoting 100, percent but mm-hmm. but you know a- anybody can Google that and look that up, and you'll you'll get a sense of whether you have binge eating disorder or not. You're not supposed to be able to diagnose yourself, but it's public information. You can do that. Um, I write, an, I write for Psychology Today fairly regularly, and although I'm a little behind in my articles, um, I wrote an article about a problem with the definition of binge eating disorder. The problem is that everybody's asking, do I have the disorder or not? The people that fall into that diagnostic criteria are approximately 2.8% of the population, depending upon what study that you look at. However, of the population are obese and um, and cardiovascular death from cardiovascular disease is up by 80%. I think I might not be quoting this exactly correctly. Diabetes, maybe it's diabetes that's up by 88% and cardiovascular disease has tripled since the last, you know, major survey 20 years ago. This is world health organization data. And so obviously there is this diagnostic entity called binge eating disorder where people are in real trouble, but 40% of us are in a lot of trouble anyway, right? And for the purposes of what I do, I, I don't actually offer treatment anymore. I offer coaching because I 
I kind of want to ignore that distinction. And I tell people, because you don't really have to give up anything you don't want to give up the way that I work with people. Some, mm-hmm. some people will come to the conclusion they have to abstain from something completely, but nobody is going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you, you have to not eat this or not eat that. Autonomy is a very important part of overcoming food addiction. Um, And so I want people to recognize that if you're eating beyond your own best judgment, especially if your health is at risk in any way, um, that there are some very simple things you can do, um, very inexpensive. We'll tell you at the end how to go to get the book for free um, that can make a gigantic difference. So I hope that's okay that I answered that question in that way, because I'm more concerned. I'm more concerned with the people who don't have binge eating disorder and then will walk away and think, well, I don't have to do anything about this then. That does or, make sense. Yes, yeah. that makes sense. And I think that from maybe what I'm hearing you say is the diagnostic classification of being an overeater, being a food addict, being a binge eater doesn't matter as much because the treatment or the recommendations are similar for all of them. Yeah, I, our recommendations <laughs> are similar for all of them. What? What we will find with people who have diagnosed binge eating disorder that's different than perhaps the rest of the crew, they might be called, um, I mean, there's binge eating disorder, then there's anorexia and bulimia, and there's, you know, eating disorder not otherwise specified, which is pretty, pretty big category. Um, what does tend to be different for people with binge eating disorder, anorexia, or bulimia is that often they don't recover unless they're willing to let go of um, sugar, flour, and alcohol entirely. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot lot of people do, you know, I have a lot of people who say, you know, yes, I was one of the worst cases of binge eating disorder and I was 300 pounds. And, you know, I, I made one simple rule and I never had to give up sugar in the first place. There are people who do that. And so we, um, we will work with people who want to try that, but more, I would say a higher proportion of people who are diagnosed with binge eating disorder don't seem to recover and they're like, until they let go of the sugar, flour, and, and alcohol. Mm-hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Um, and you know that one of my great friends, one of my best friends has struggled with binge eating disorder and man, she has researched the heck out of binge eating disorder and read different books and tried a couple of programs and, you know, it's, it's over a decade long battle and I'm really proud of her effort. You know, she's never given up. She has seen consistent improvements and she seems to go in cycles, maybe of periods where she'll be a little bit more restrictive and then kind of experiment, but not sure about her trigger foods. And that's kind of where I wanted to steer the conversation next was about, do you believe in trigger foods? Like, how do you coach people to, you know, start overcoming their, their binge or their overeating condition? Where do you start? Okay. Um, remind me to complete this with the trigger food discussion. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. I do believe in trigger foods. I don't believe that everybody has to give them up. I think there mm-hmm. are, there are ways to, to regulate them for a lot of people in my, in our practice, we find um, two out of three people who would like to continue to eat their trigger foods are able to do so if they're very specific about it because um, willpower is a fatigable muscle. And most people are given the idea that, gee, I could eat chocolate 10% of the time and abstain from it 90% of the time. The problem is you haven't specified what's the 10%, what's the 90%. So every time you're in front of a chocolate bar, you have to use a little more willpower and mm-hmm. make a decision. Whereas if you say, I will only ever have chocolate on Saturday or I'll, I'll never have more than one ounce of dark chocolate per day and only on the weekend, you've made all your decisions for chocolate throughout the week and you're not burning willpower all the time. Yeah. And willpower is kind of like gas in the tank. If you notice, it's harder to eat well at night than it is in the morning. It is, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's why a little trick for people is to make their food plans in the morning, uh, prepare mm-hmm. their food, put it in Tupperware. Um, so a, a high percentage of our clients are, but two out of three, are able to regulate their trigger foods conditionally. One out of three can't. Uh, for example, I discovered I'm not someone who can regulate chocolate. 
I wish that I were. I tried six ways to Sunday. I tried all kinds of different rules. I just had to become someone that, you know, never ate chocolate again. And it's been years and years and years. I don't think about it. It looks like a, um, when I see the chocolate bar that used to torture me in the supermarket, it looks like a big bag of chemicals to me. I, I, I just have no interest. There are other things that I can regulate. I, I can have a vegan pizza if I really want to. Um, I've got to, I've got to kind of plan it out and figure out exactly when and how much and what am I going to do before and after to make sure I get enough nutrition that day and how am I going to deal with the blood sugar spikes and, and crashes. I can do that if I really want to. I've come to the point that I don't really want to. Mm-hmm. It, it, um, I just don't like the way that I feel afterwards and I, I'm happier without it. So um, the notion, see, it, it, in our culture, we use passive language when it comes to overeating troubles. We'll say, oh my God, the chocolate smell at the bakery triggered me. Where, where when you do that, you're, I, I mean, you're describing an experience that a lot of people recognize and they'll, they'll kind of laugh and they'll say, you know, oh yeah, I can't walk past that place either. Um, however, you're eliminating the space between stimulus and response and you're abdicating your power. You're abdicating the power that you do have. What, what you want to do is use more active language instead and say the smell of the chocolate bakery um, reminded me of previous memories that I've had enjoying chocolate with my grandmother, whatever it was. And so I chose to reverse my best intentions um, from my best thinking previously and go ahead and buy the chocolate and eat it. And it sounds like a subtle difference. It's a little hard for people because there's a little bit of guilt and shame that goes along with it. Oh my God, I reversed my best intentions. But by doing that, you're opening up a space between stimulus and and response where you can Mm -hmm. insert yourself and learn to do that. By the way, if the smell of bakeries or restaurants or pizza places is bothering you, you can do one of two things in the beginning. You can put a little bit of Vicks Vapor Rub over your upper lip as you're walking by, and you're kind of removing the stimulus to a certain extent when you do that. I know that it sounds a little weird. I don't want you to do that forever. Or you could avoid taking that route home. You could take a different route home. So you're eliminating the prompt. You're eliminating the stimulus. That's something I call training wheels. That's something you want to do Mm -hmm. in the beginning as you're creating a cocoon for your new habits to develop. In the end, I want you to get to the point that you could stand in the bakery for an hour and, you know, not, not violate your no sugar rule. I remember a woman who not only had to stand in the bakery, but she owned the bakery. And so she had to, you know, sell it and make it look attractive to other people. So all day long, she's telling people how delicious things are, but she was not having a bite. And I said, how the heck did you do that? She says, oh, that's easy. I never eat sugar or flour. So that is not my food. I would look at it and I would say, that is not my food. She made all the decisions beforehand. It took no willpower whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, She just got used to the fact that that was not her food and she was okay. You want to get there in the long run, in the beginning, it's better not to overstimulate yourself. So the question of whether I believe in food triggers, I think that they are, um, they're part of the addictive cycle, but in, in the long run, you want to be able to face them down and you don't want to shrink from life because food is everywhere. I mean, we, we live yeah. in a society which has agreed to, which has tacitly agreed to slowly kill themselves with food. And you can walk out of McDonald's and there's a Burger King across the street. So what are you going to do? It's, you, you, can't, you can't lock yourself in your room at night. So I wanted to know, I know that some people listening to this, they just internally revolt to rules, you know, even if they're self-imposed rules, it's almost like they make a rule and then they want it more. I'm not going to have chocolate Monday through Friday. And then it's kind of like you said, once you learn that from your mom, then you wanted more chocolate. So how do you coach people to overcome that internal resistance that inevitably pops up when they're trying to have more self-discipline around food? Well, um, there are philosophies in our world and and in recovering from eating disorders, which say that rules are bad. Any restriction will cause a binge, even a mental restriction. Mm -hmm. And so they suggest you should not distinguish between good foods and bad foods and that you, um, that you should not, not adopt any rules and they kind of rail against what, what we do. Um, I think that that works to a certain extent for a lot of people, the elimination of all rules, 
because most binge eaters, most overeaters have had a time in their upbringing where they were fed against their own best interests. And so they developed a kind of rebelliousness, which was a good thing um, as a survival need. You know, if, if your parents were too busy or they didn't know, or they come from some culture where overeating is really reinforced, then there's a part of you that knows this is not good. If I want to yeah. live a, a healthy life, this is not good. I got to take care of myself. I can't listen to their rules. Uh, my ex-wife was brought up um, in a deli by, by kosher parents who were very hypocritical. And so there was no way she wouldn't even read my book. Um, there was no way that, um, that she would do this. And so by eliminating the rules, you eliminate that rebellion. And there are some people who can then work to eat mindfully and have anything they want to in moderation. And that's the ultimate dream for most people. There are problems with that though. The problem is, and this is what most people who come from that philosophy and aren't quite satisfied talk to me about. They say, well, I'm not really eating as healthy as I would like to. Right. Like I'm, I'm not binging. I'm, I'm at a reasonable rate, but I don't really feel as healthy as I would like to feel. And I'd like to take more control over that. The other problem is that we live in a world where it's almost impossible to be mindful every time that you eat. You know, there, there are just so many screens and decisions and input coming at us and we you know, we're not meant to live in four walls staring at electronics all day. Um, and so it's very difficult. I think mindfulness is a wonderful thing. I think it can help people to eat better, but it's not really possible to do that all the time. And the last thing is that those people are taught to eat when they're hungry and stop when they're full. Well, if you lived the life that I live consulting for the big food industry, you would know that there were billions of dollars spent on, on, on breaking your hungry and full meters. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when you have a lot of these, these bags and boxes and containers manufactured by these, you know, white guys with mustaches and suits um, laughing all the way to the bank, I guess that's a little prejudice, but um, you, you, you would have respect for the power that the industry has. And, and so it's to the point that there is flavored cardboard in the food system. It's actually legal in some places, but flavored cardboard in the food system. And so at some point you have to stand up and say, there is definitely a difference between healthy food and unhealthy food. And, and it's a higher maturational level, I think, to, yeah. to say, um, I'm not, so I have an inner two-year-old. I'm not going to, I'm not going to give that inner two-year-old all the power for the rest of my life. Um, I know that in the past I've acted badly because I was, I, I wasn't respecting the inner two-year-old, but I can go further and I can define what healthy eating means for me personally, and I can, I can make a rule. The other thing is that um, when you're unwilling to draw a very clear bullseye, let's think of an archer. The archer draws a very clear bullseye around the target so that they know not only whether or not they hit it, but when they missed it, by how much and in what direction, yeah. so they can use that feedback to make the right, the right adjustments. Um, when you say, I'm not going to aim at a very specific bullseye. I'm just going to kind of sort of go in that direction. You're eliminating the opportunity to get that feedback and get better and better and better with each, with each try. Mm -hmm. And so I find that um, I, I lose some of these people who say that, um, you know, my approach is too restrictive and you like a good kitchen knife, you could use it for evil. You can use it for good. Um, so people could use my approach to, limit calories and nutrition too much. And I don't want them to do that. Right. But, but I say that having a clearly defined um, set of rules for the food triggers and behaviors that you have trouble with, nothing more. Mm -hmm. um, it just, just like if you were a city traffic planner, you'd only put red lights and stop signs at the intersections, which required them and then drive freely throughout the city. Otherwise, I think that's a higher mat maturation of level than saying, well, we can't have any red lights or stop signs because you can have a lot of accidents in that, in that case. So those yeah. are great analogies, both the, the stop lights and the target. Mm -hmm. um, my audience knows I'm big on James Clear and he, in his book, Atomic Habits, talks about implementation intentions. And the whole premise there is to be specific. You know, if, if you have a goal, this is going to be aired in 2022, probably. So New Year's resolution to eat less sugar probably didn't get you very far because it wasn't specific enough. You didn't draw a clear enough bullseye for what that meant for you. Like what, what less sugar are you going to eat? And when are you going to do that? 
And so I, I love that you're bringing some specificity to the conversation about food addiction, overeating, um, and binge eating. Oh, I just wanted to help you with the sugar addiction in particular. Mm -hmm. What we found with rules about sugar are that you, um, it's better to make an inclusive rule than an exclusive rule. So if you mm -hmm. say, I'll never have sugar again, what's sugar? Is the sugar in your tomato sauce okay? Is whole fruit okay? Uh, what about, you know, stevia in your coffee? But if you say the only sweet tastes I'll ever eat again are whole fruit, berry, berries, um, stevia in my, in my coffee or tea, and one dessert of my choosing on Thanksgiving, New Year's, and Christmas, plus, you know, five birthday parties a year, wh however specific you want to be about it, then there's no wiggle room for your pig to play around with that. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. I think that's a very important takeaway. So be inclusive. And I think that helps combat that restrictive inner child that wants to rebel. Tell yourself what you can do instead of telling your, yourself what you can't do. I think it just yes. feels better on the inside. Now to help people um, understand the inner pig a little bit better, you kept a journal for many years on yours. Will you tell us what some recurring themes or thoughts of your inner pig were that you had to work to overcome? Just one bite. Just, uh -huh. just, just one bite. That was probably the worst one. That's not really going to hurt. Come on, Glenn, you have control now. You've gotten so good at this never binge again thing and you know, keeping, me, keeping me caged up that you can go right back to eating well tomorrow. And mm -hmm. what I've discovered is just one bite is the difference between who's the boss, me or my pig, right? And it's the difference between eating on impulse versus eating by design. And when I allow myself to eat on impulse or emotions, even if it's just one bite off of my carefully thought through plan, then I am allowing the pig to take control. And that breaks my spirit. Mm -hmm. And when my spirit is broken, that's the first step to a slippery slope that goes further and further and further. So just one bite makes all the difference. Just one bite always hurts. Um, you can change your, see, people also get confused about the language we use. When we say, when, when we say, I will, I used to have a rule that said, I will never eat um, dried fruit without nuts. Because at the time I thought that that slowed down the glycemic load of the, of the, of the dried fruit by having mm -hmm. nuts. And then there was some more research that said, well, no, um, it actually makes it worse when you have when you have the nuts with the dried fruit. So when my doctor presented that to me, what was I going to do? I was going to say, I'm sorry. I said I would never do that again, so I'm never going to do that again. No. You can change your food plan anytime you want to. The point is to do it with forethought and consideration from your upper brain and not impulsively when your pig wants to do it. So I tell people to write down uh, what they want to change very specifically, why they want to do it. Um, keep a copy of the old rule and then wait 24 to 48 hours before the new rule takes effect. And that protects them against these impulsive changes. Mm -hmm. when, when we say I will never do X again, we're, it's like we're talking to a two-year-old. When my, when my niece was two years old, I told her that she could never, ever, ever cross the street without holding my hand. Never, ever, 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 because I didn't want her even having the image of crossing the street in her mind. She's just too little, was too dangerous. Was I lying to her? Well, yeah, because I knew that in five or six years, we're going to teach her how to look both ways and cross the street. But you don't tell that, you don't, you don't say that to a two-year-old. You say never, ever, ever, because it's not safe. They don't have the impulse control to manage the thought. So it's the same thing here. When we're creating a rule, we're presenting it to our inner pig as if it were set in stone, because the inner pig acts like a two-year-old with regards to a lot of these, these um, troubled trigger foods and behaviors. Mm -hmm. I think this is a really, you, you just speak very eloquently about this topic. And I think that we are so hard on ourselves because we, it's like, they know, we know that we shouldn't be overindulging in sugar and then they do it. 
And so I think it's very important to recognize what part of the brain, that lizard brain that you speak of is in charge of that moment of impulse and speak to it in a language that it can understand. Yeah. And it's simple, clear. And I think I'm very big on paying attention to the words that you're using and changing the language that you're using. And I love that you're bringing kind of this entire conversation together um, to help us really have better self-control because that's what you said it's all about. You know, it wasn't so much about the weight loss for you starting out. It was about feeling like you were in control again, feeling like you have the power again, which is interesting just as a little sidebar. Do you find in your experience that sometimes people develop these eating disorders as a sense to, to, to gain control? That's kind of my experience, adolescent girls, especially. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. That's something they can Uh, control. You can control, um, first of all, the pleasure is available to you much more than Mm -hmm. the real people in your life, much more consistently, right? You can, I could get a chocolate bar much more easily than I could get along with my wife. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, Secondly, as unpleasant as the recovery period is after a binge, it's familiar. It's something you can learn to to get through hour by hour. And um, people will be comforted by that pathological control um, because it makes them feel like the rest of their life that really is not controllable is more um, like at least is something that they can't control. However, that would lead you, that could lead you to believe that you have to fix the rest of your life before you can stop. And it turns out, may, may I talk a little bit about emotional eating and what? Please what, do. Okay. Yes. So most people are under the impression that emotions cause binges. Emotions cause binges. What they don't know is that binges cause emotions too. It's, it's a dual relationship. Um, so let's take the feeling of being out of control. If you, if you feel out of control and you go have a binge, your body has learned that an abundance of calories are available when you feel out of control and it will teach itself to feel out of control more. Um, it's more, Mm -hmm. it's more, it's easier to illustrate with anxiety. A lot of people will say they feel too anxious and they can't sleep unless they binge before bed. Well, there are physiological correlates of anxiety. Our our galvanic spin response goes up. Our respiration goes up. Perspiration goes up. um, Our blood pressure goes up. And you can do animal studies where you measure these things. And if you reinforce the animal with a sugar reward, every time it has high blood pressure, for example, we find that those animals have learned to have consistently higher blood pressure. Hmm. So... What this tells you, the principle is operant conditioning. What this tells you is that binging creates anxiety. It doesn't relieve anxiety. At the moment, the reward is distracting you from the anxiety. At the moment, it brings it down a little bit. But if you were to measure your anxiety overall of the course of the month, with and without binging, you'd probably find that your anxiety is much lower without binging than with binging, even though you had that moment, those moments in the evening. So there is a dual relationship like that. And secondly, there's a space between emotion and action. And if you learn how to sever the link between the emotion and the action, then you don't have to fix the emotion. You can just build that better fireplace. And your therapy, if you think of it as separate and apart from stopping the overeating behavior, your therapy will be supercharged. If you're someone who really wants to work on those internal emotions, and I'm someone like that, then if you can teach yourself to stop binging, the emotions will be much easier to focus on. You can look at the fire more safely if it's contained in a fireplace. If looking at the fire means uh, possibly letting it out, then you causing danger, you're not going to look at the fire. So, Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for explaining that. Um, I'm sure that your book would be really helpful for people who do struggle with these concepts that we've been talking about today. And before you share where they can get that, were there, were there any other tips or suggestions that you wanted to share? Well, I would share that most people live on one of two extremes. There are, I'm not sure if we talked about this already because I did a couple of interviews today. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, they're merging in my head a little bit. People are 
prone to trying to be too good to make up for the times when they were too bad. Mm -hmm. And so if you could start with one simple rule, like something you could and would do, something, um, you know, I won't eat in front of the TV or I'll put my fork down between bites or something simple so that you can feel successful. That's the best way to start. And then listen for that voice inside of you to say, no, you should cross that line. You shouldn't do that. That's the best way to start. And I would also tell you that, um, th- that this is a lot simpler than it seems. It doesn't have to, even if you've been at this for 20 years, even if you've been trying to do this for 20 years, the solution can be a lot simpler than it seems. It's like if you were flailing around in the mud for 20 years and you kept thinking there must be a, you know, must be a complex solution, but really what you need to do is stand up and clean yourself off and walk away. Um, you could drown in two inches of mud. You can. It's a very unpleasant experience. If you, but when you see the solution, it can be much simpler than you ever thought it would be. So yeah. um, that's what I'm hoping to bring to people. Wonderful. Well, l- tell our audience where they can learn more about you and get your book. So if you go to neverbingeagain.com and you click the big red button and you sign up for the reader bonuses, you can get a copy of the Kindle, Nook, or PDF version for free. You, we also have Audible and paperback, but there's a charge for that. Um, you can also get for free a set of recorded coaching sessions. The reason we did that was because I know you all must be thinking, this guy has lost it. Why does Dr. Morgan have a psychologist? No. Got a, okay. <laughs> no, no, I'm sure um, they're going to love this one. It's a, it's a very compassionate process. People go from feeling despairing and powerless and hopeless the feeling enthusiastic and hopeful and powerful in one session. Um, so I want you to hear that. And we have a set of food plan starter templates. So some people ask me, well, what if I'm doing keto or what if I'm doing plant-based or point counting or calorie counting? There is a set of, the system is diet agnostic. You, you decide what rules are for you. Yeah. We help you stick to them as, as long as it's a reasonable system. There are some rules you can't make. I tell people, You can't make rules that go against your body. You can't say, I will never eat again. You can't say, I will never pee again. Your body's going to tell you otherwise after a while. Um, So neverbingeagain.com, click the big red button. You get a whole bunch of stuff. And anything else you're curious about, our social media, our coaching programs and stuff, you'll get to eventually if you do that. Big red button. Awesome. And we'll be sure to link all of those resources in the show notes. Um, Dr. Livingston, thank you so much for joining us. I know that this one's going to resonate hard and I love how simple, simple you make it, you know, so thanks for all of your great little tips today. Thank you so much.